This video is sponsored by NVIDIA AI. I have a confession to make. I enjoy suffering. I do. I mean, why else would I willingly watch Madam Web, Wish, The Marvels, Secret Invasion, Echo, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, and most recently, Netflix's live action version of Avatar The Last Airbender. While they all inflicted terrible suffering on my soul, it also left me wondering a couple of things, like where did I park my car? I've been stuck here at AMC since I watched Madam Web a couple of weeks ago. But more importantly, why the hell is everything so goddamn mediocre? No, dude, not you. You're absolutely perfect, sweetheart. For one thing, there seems to be very little creative force left in Hollywood. You all right? Yes, fine, why? Why does it look all right? Most projects are either sequels or reboots with very flimsy reasons for why a reboot is necessary. Take Avatar The Last Airbender, for example. The original show is perfection. Despite being intended for children, the show has unexpected depth. And despite the limits in budget and its medium, it's just as visually satisfying as it is emotionally. So let's be honest, this story did not need a retelling. Regardless, Netflix forged on, getting the original creators Michael and Brian on board and then quickly frustrated them into quitting. Their departure is indicative of one of the biggest issues with the entertainment industry, the executive's unwillingness to trust creators. In a statement after his departure, here's what Brian had to say. When Netflix brought me on board to run this series alongside Mike two years ago, they made a very public promise to support our vision. Unfortunately, there was no follow through on that promise. Though I got to work with some great individuals, both on Netflix's side and our small development team, the general handling of the project created what I felt was a negative and unsupportive environment. So why exactly is this happening? Why were Brian and Mike able to create the masterpiece that is the original show at Nickelodeon, but not given the space to do the same at Netflix, despite their incredible track record? Why was Netflix willing to put $120 million on the line, but not trust the creators behind the magic? The problem is the money itself. With such massive budgets at stake for an industry that is definitely in decline, means executives have to ensure success, turning every project into an opportunity to rule by committee. This type of governance is poisonous to the creative types who crave trust and space in order to let their vision come to life. The result of this committee-based approach is the exit of the talent, and the output is a perfectly mediocre show like Netflix's Avatar The Last Airbender, where no emotional moment has the space to land, none of the important character development is done effectively, allowing the connection to the audience to build over time. Instead, it's all rushed, condensed, every question answered immediately, and everything constantly being told instead of shown. Gotta admit, he has a way with people. Do you get it? He knows how to connect. To get through to people like he did last night. Do you get it? That's his real power. Connection. Building bridges. Oh my god, do you get it? That's how he's gonna be the Avatar. Do you get it? There goes the savior of the world. Okay, okay, we get it. God having effectively bullied away people with even a modicum of talent. The executives put in place inexperienced people who are easier to control. In turn, the people willing to take these positions are often types that don't mind rehashing old stories instead of creating something unique and new. At the same time, they neither respect the original work they are recycling, nor do they recognize what made it excellent in the first place. This is the type of disrespect for the original work that has led to the box office disasters like Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, the Marvels and streaming disasters like Echo and Secret Invasion, to name a few. In fact, Disney now directs their newest DEI-based hires to actively ignore the original comic books that the projects are based off of. Now, I would respect this if the directive went further and encouraged their new hires to go into uncharted lands and create new stories, but that's not what's happening. They still insist on using the recognizable IP of these characters, standing on the hard work of the original creators, but go on to mangle the characters, often turning the men into pathetic background afterthoughts. To take the hard work of another artist and tear it to shreds while its legacy pays for your afternoon triple venti, half-sweet, non-fat caramel macchiato is just a slap in the face of artistic integrity. A veteran screenwriter anonymously wrote an open letter to the film and TV business hosted on the wonderful Film Threat website, where he said, What I took away is that these young Turks think working in film and TV is just a fun thing that anyone can do, and they can use this opportunity to put their stamp on the world. This right here is really important because our recent cultural overemphasis on diversity has somehow convinced people that good work doesn't require hard work. And that's the mind virus that has taken over the newest hires in the entertainment business. 
they think that the only reason people achieved anything, success, fame, wealth, was simply the result of privilege or a seat at the table. They have no understanding of the sweat nor the talent necessary. They don't understand the concept of art. They think diversity is enough because of the countless times that Rachel Zegler has said representation matters. This brings us to Wish, but before we talk about that terrible movie, a quick aside. I love reading all of your comments on this channel because you guys often share incredible insights with me and many of you have written to me about your desire to start making content. If any of you are interested in doing that but aren't sure where to start, consider checking out InVideo AI today's sponsor. InVideo is an AI video creator tool which allows you to turn ideas into content, meaning you can create a publish-ready video using simple text prompts. You can start with a simple prompt, and using their easy-to-use interface, you can build on your ideas in collaboration with the tool, and you can create a fully-fledged-out video to share your opinions, ideas, and your creativity with the world. Have you ever wondered why the killer whale is considered the ocean's top predator? If you don't like the output, you can make edits using the command box. You can also have the platform create videos in your own replicated voice. I know, I know many people can get turned off from AI, feeling like humans are going to be replaced by these types of tools, but I really see it as a method to level up your game because you can leverage a tool like InVideo to create things that might have felt out of reach before. You can get started with InVideo AI for free and create up to four videos with a watermark. But if you're serious about video creation and want to publish videos without a watermark, you can upgrade to a paid plan for as low as $20 a month. A paid account also gives you access to millions of royalty-free stock footage clips, as well as better options for voiceovers, which typically costs hundreds of dollars. Check out InVideo AI using the link in the description, and I'm really curious to see what you all create. Thank you to InVideo for sponsoring this video, and now back to talking about Wish. The movie intended to be a celebration of the last hundred years of Disney animation, but instead felt like an unpleasant reminder of how far the company has fallen. The movie is an original story, and I use the terms original and story lightly, because many people have wondered if it was stitched together by AI. The movie's goal, above all, was representation. All the diverse characters are reliably good and write about everything. The main character, Asha, has no character flaw, nor does she need to learn anything to achieve her full potential and the villain is a white cis male for good measure. It checks all the boxes of a dutifully pandering story and yet it failed. Wish lacked a story, it lacked proper characters, and most importantly, it lacked heart. And as a result, it lost Disney $200 million. So why didn't the representation strategy win out? Amongst the diversity, equity, and inclusivity crowd, there is this belief that representation is necessary because each individual has a unique perspective, a unique story, and we need to create space to let people from varying backgrounds bring their truths to the table. So Maya from Echo being a woman, as well as Native American and deaf and an amputee means we have to all shut the hell up because she's going to bless us with a perspective so unique that it will be earth shattering. This is just such a false idea. It's meant to stoke the egos of people who have no talent, no ability, no skill they've worked on. So instead they're applauded for whatever victim narratives they can spin up based on checked boxes they happen to be part of. Moreover, what is the point of putting diverse women into central roles if they lack the humanity that would make it possible for people to connect with them. Asha has no discernible flaws. She has nothing holding her back, and she has no inclination to be romantically attached to anyone. Because according to the current feminist overlords, women shouldn't be focused on love. Or more succinctly put, men ill. Maya from Echo is the same. She has no flaws. But along with that, she has no personality, no passions, and no expressions to speak of. Instead, Maya's and Asha's existence as main characters should be enough to the diverse women that connect with them simply based on the surface level traits. This is called pandering. Pandering is a surprisingly effective strategy on social media, where people clamor to commend you on recognizing your privilege or your willingness to step aside for the sake of marginalized groups. Bravo! You're the wokest of the woke folk that ever woked. It's a great strategy to up your fake online reputation. She's making a lot of sense, Pop. That's all right on all accounts. Going to the movies or watching a show, however, is a different experience altogether. It's a very personal, disarming affair. We go to the movies to feel, and I know, I know, I'm sounding like Nicole Kidman in an AMC commercial, but it's true. Good stories speak to us. They speak to our humanity. They capture emotions so true that we are revealed in it. It's not something that can be tweeted or captured in a selfie. It's ineffable. 
good stories aren't obsessed with how we're all different. Instead, they focus on our universal experiences, like the fear before your first battle. Courage, Mary. Courage for our friends. The devastation of finding your sister when you thought she was safe at home. The heartbreak of losing your father because you made a mistake or seeing how you've missed out on your children's entire lives in the span of a couple of hours. These are the moments that stay with us because we don't want to be pandered to or reprimanded. We want to be taken for an adventure, fantasize as our favorite hero. We want to feel. We want a connection, goddammit. And a connection has nothing to do with the color of someone's skin and everything to do with the skill and talent of the writers, the directors, the actors, the animators, all the artists that come together to create magic. And that's what's missing from these modern movies and TV shows. Thank you all for watching. And if you happen to know where my car is parked, please let me know so I can finally go home.